So now I'm Mike Devine. I'm the pastor here at Arbor Point Church. Uh, last week, I left you all kind of hanging with the weight of a multitude of sins. I went through the list, three of the lists that Paul has for us, and uh, each of us is found in those lists somewhere. Um, and I left it there just because it was impressed upon me. Sometimes we need to think about that and think about where we are because it's really easy just to get in a habit of sin and not recognize it, not spend the time to seek to change that. See, because I do wonder if we, as, if the body of Christ took aim at the sin in our lives instead of just kind of accepting that they're always going to be there, I just, I just think the church might just experience this, this revival and new birth that we all want so much. Uh, this week we're transitioning from that into forgiveness. It's a two-week sermon series from, from Ministry Matters, um, and I thought it was a good kind of follow-up from where we were last week. See, I find that as I grow older that following Jesus <laughs> is not as easy <laughs> as we often make it sound. It's, um, it's necessary to learn self-control. And uh, that's a tough thing, you know, self-denial, actually. I have to be willing to deny some of those things that just pop in my head, you know, and, and, I, and, I, and I fall short of the mark, you know, I miss the mark. The good news, though, is that I'm not the final say when it comes to overcoming sin. Because Jesus accomplished that for, for me and for you when he gave his life on the cross. In other words, all of the lists of sin that we covered last week. Every one of them is covered in the grace and love of Christ. There is no sin bigger than, the gra than grace can cover. You know, God wants us to work on it. He wants us to become more and more like Jesus, but he also doesn't want us to be in condemnation either. There is therefore no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. That's Romans 8.1. And if we're in condemnation, then we're, being, we're listening to the voice of the enemy. Or a voice from our past, because that's not God's voice. God's voice will reprimand us and try and get us back in line, but not condemn us. So it's a, there's a tension in that, because I don't want us to take the kind of, I don't want to take grace, that kind of, that expansive, extensive grace that's offered. I don't want to take that for granted, because it costs so much. And each of us and I have a role to play in battling sin in my life. It's not just, okay, God, take, take it. You know, I have some choices that I need to make and some decisions in order to align myself to where God would have me to be. And it's a cool thing that even our heroes of the faith miss the mark. That's one of the great things about the Bible as we go through and we look at it, you know, because we're not alone. You know, God, God gave us a whole bunch of characters in the Bible. And every single, well, maybe one, who, who was it that, that was uh, dedicated? It wasn't Nathan. Was it Nathan or Samuel? The one that was dedicated at birth? Samuel. Samuel. Maybe not him, but every other <laughs> character in the Bible that messed things up and screwed up. Um, they just didn't give up on fighting against sin in their lives. And one of my heroes uh, is, uh, was a shepherd boy who played music and turned into a warrior and turned into a king, uh, obviously King David, but he was very imperfect. He was an imperfect guy. So the passage that I'm going to use this morning is, is follows David having slept with Uriah the Hittite's wife, Bathsheba. See, he saw her and from uh, above and saw her by a pool, and then he invited her over, and, and he slept with her, and she got pregnant. So he was one called Uriah back from battle, trying to get him to go and be with his wife so that he wouldn't get caught. Uriah decided he'd sleep on the porch until, you know, the battle was over, and so that didn't work. So when he sent him back, he had him go to the, where the battle was the hard, strongest and basically to be killed. And so that's where we are, and here's our passage out of 2 Samuel chapter 12. But God was not at all pleased with what David had done and sent Nathan to David. Nathan said to him, there were two men in the same city, one rich, the other poor. The rich man had huge flocks of sheep, herds of cattle. The poor man had nothing but one little female lamb, which he had bought and raised. It grew up with him and his children as a member of the family. It ate off his plate and drank from his cup and slept on his bed. It was like a daughter to him. Then one day a traveler 
dropped in on the rich man. He was too stingy to take an animal from his own herds or flocks to make a meal for his visitor. So he took the poor man's lamb and prepared a meal to set before his guest. David exploded in anger. As surely as God lives, he said to Nathan, the man who did this ought to be lynched. He must repay for the lamb four times over his crime and his stinginess. You're the man, Nathan said. And here's what God, the God of Israel, has to say to you. I made you king over Israel. I freed you from the fist of Saul. I gave you your master's daughter and other wives to have and to hold. I gave you both Israel and Judah. And if that hadn't been enough, I'd have gladly thrown in much more. So why have you treated the word of God with brazen contempt, doing this great evil? You murdered Uriah the Hittite, then took his wife as your wife. And worse, you killed him with an Ammonite sword. And now, because you treated God with such contempt and took Uriah the Hittite's wife as your wife, killing and murder will continually plague your family. And they did the rest of David's life. This is God speaking, remember? I'll make trouble for you out of your own family. I'll take your wives from right out in front of you. I'll give them to some neighbor, and he'll go to bed with them openly. You did your deed in secret. I'm doing mine with the whole country watching. And that happened with Absalom. Then David confessed to Nathan, I've sinned against God. Nathan pronounced, yes, but that's not the last word. God forgives your sin. You won't die for it. But because of your blasphemous behavior, your son born to you will die. There's a Sunday school teacher, and she was teaching that, that day on forgiveness. She began with a question. What do you have to do in order to be forgiven? What do you have to do in order to be forgiven? Boy, shot, hand shot up. Well, in order to be forgiven, you've got to sin. <laughs> sin is a word that is throughout the Bible. The Old Testament word is hata. And it mean, it's meaning to sin, to miss, miss the mark, go wrong, incur guilt. Um, the New Testament word is hamartia, which is uh, an archery word, which means to miss the mark, to err, be mistaken, wander from the path, so to speak, of, of, of uprightness and honor, to wander from the law of God, to violate God's law. That which is done wrong, sin, and offense. This is just the strong definition of all of that. Hata and hamartia are both archery terms, which I like a lot because, you know, if I shoot at a picture of bullseye and a target, if I shoot at that bullseye from here and I just miss by this much, you know, and that arrow just, it just barely misses the center of that bullseye, but it keeps going, you know what happens? It keeps getting further and further away. And that's where conviction in the Holy Spirit comes in because that helps us to go, wait a minute. And helps us to correct, because otherwise we'll, we'll end up so far away from God that it'll be, you know, it's, it's harder to get back. So the Holy Spirit is constantly trying to, hey, wait a minute, get back, get back. And the quicker we get back, the, the easier it is, right? Because <laughs> we're, we're close to the mark. But sin is a problem for us. The Bible's first 11 chapters try to explain why the world is in so, such a mess that it's in. Those chapters of Genesis trace this, 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 all this trouble, the one thing. You know what it is? You don't know? Sin. Sin, yeah, the fall. Sin is the common condition for us now. We all do wrong and we fail to do what's right, whether we intend it or not. We've got to find a way to deal with sin. And the story of David and Bathsheba illustrates how we can fall into sin so easily and how we can find our way back to God. The first step is the sin itself. In David's case, it begins, as a lot of wrongdoing does, a single glance or desire. You know, he let it sit. He looked and he saw and then he let it stay there and he desired Bathsheba. The biblical word is to covet. Thou shalt not covet. See, coveting has a way of evolving into action if, we're, if, if we don't deal with it. And that's why Jesus talks so much about impulses, about what goes on inside of us, that it matters what we think, that it matters what's going on in our head and our heart. Desires are the springboard to action. We're going to think about something before we do it, right? Yeah? Makes sense? It's hard to do something that you haven't thought about. 
in Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, he linked coveting and adultery, which is David's story. He coveted, led him to adultery, and then he broke the tenth and the seventh of the Ten Commandments, but he wasn't done because he sent Uriah to be killed. So he violated the sixth as well. Notice how one wrongdoing led to another wrongdoing, led to another wrongdoing. Sin multiplies if we don't acknowledge it, go to God with it, lay it at his feet and ask him into us. And surround ourselves with other followers because we need one another to keep us on track. So the first thing that has to happen is sin. But the step two is sometimes we just kind of enjoy the deed. Until David got caught, he, he was fine. You know, until the prophet came in, he wasn't going, oh, no. He was like, huh, I got away with that. He was justifying it. They had a son. He was happy about that. Life felt good, right? Life is good. Except it wasn't because the third step in this process is the moment of discovery. That which is done in secret will become known. And when that became known, it, it, the, his guilt came up. And God sent, had to send Nathan to do that. God sent Nathan to uncover David's deed and name it for what it was. So that was pretty dramatic. Most of the time, it's not that dramatic. But a friend who comes up to us and says, Mike, you know, wh why are you doing that? Why are you going to that place? Why are you spending so much time online? Why are you, you know, just kind of trying to help to correct a path? It's usually far less dramatic, but it's really important for us. But there's a holy discontent that happens when we get involved in sin. Something goes on in our heart. You know, you, you can't sin and have the Holy Spirit in you without that clashing. And it's that clash, clashing that creates a discontent and reminds us that we are to be holy as Christ is holy. You know, right? I missed the mark. I can get back soon or I can wait. And, it, and, and have it be more painful. And oftentimes we'll start to bargain as well. And I know none of you do that because, you know, you're holy and stuff. But, but I, uh, I, I oftentimes will, will, well, God, if you'll do this, then I'll do this, you know. I actually did that with my call now that I think about it. You know, I, I said, okay, if you're going to, if you really, 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 after four years of arguing, if you really, really want me to go to seminary, then I, I can't afford to go to seminary, so you're, you know. You're going to have to give me some help financially. If you do that, then okay. You know, that was my bargaining. And, uh, of course, I ended up in seminary. <laughs> bargaining, a time of bargaining. The wrongdoer in, in sin, we respond to a situation in a lot of different ways. It's not my fault. Uh, I'm innocent of that. Try to cover it up. Stonewall. Keep it from becoming known. You know, cut some kind of a deal, right, with God. But in the end, we're going to end up having to confess. And there's a beautiful thing about con confessing, confession to God. I think when I was in seminary, we had a discussion about the great revivals. And I, I think all of them, although I, I'd have to look to be positive, but if not all, most of the great revivals started because of a, con a confessionary movement. The people got humble enough to go to God and say, ah, we need you. You know, it's like David. I have sinned against the Lord. He immediately, he didn't fight about it once he was caught. He didn't argue with Nathan. He said, I have sinned against the Lord. You know, he confessed. That's not easy to do. None of us want to do that. His deeds were really terrible. But Israel felt obliged to record them in our scriptures. See, there's something that Israel could never forget about David, his, his truthfulness and his decisiveness. He was truly a man after God's own heart. And I love that about him because he made so many mistakes, but he never left God. Reading through the Psalms, he'll lament, he'll cry out. I relate to that. Man, there are days when I just want to cry out to God. Say, Lord, help. Nevertheless, will I follow him. Never, nevertheless, will I believe. I'm going to keep keep trudging and keep walking this path. But I need you. You know, David said boldly, he said, the consequences are mine. I did it. 
The funny thing about consequences, see, we, we, we can choose whatever we want, right? We're free to do that, but we are not free from the consequences of that choice. For David, the consequences were his son rising, Absalom rising up against him, the loss of that child with Bathsheba, constant war throughout his life. He was not able to build the temple that he wanted to build so desperately. Consequences for sin. But restoration is what God is all about. Restoration and forgiveness generates a kind of healing that, that is really difficult to explain because it's God who makes it happen. We, we go to him and confess, and then he heals us. He knows us better than we know ourselves. And when we go to him with that humble spirit, it's a humble and contrite heart. then he shows up in powerful ways. Um, you know, around here, most of us, a lot of you have been to Walk to Emmaus. There's a, on the weekend, there's a, there's a moment called Dying Moments where you, the, you go to the cross and you confess things and you, you, know, you lay things at the cross to leave there. You know, and so I did that on my weekend in, in uh, I guess it was in 2000. And I went to sit back down in my seat. And at, when I sat back down, the weirdest thing happened. I, I've never heard the audible voice of God outside of me. But in that seat, as I sat there, I heard this internally. Mike, I love you, and I forgive you. Mike, I love you, and I forgive you. And for good measure, it was the third time. I said, Mike, I love you, and I forgive you. And in that moment, I have never felt a washing. A cl I, I felt clean. And I'm a recovering drug addict and alcoholic who was not the best of people growing up. I wasn't a horrible person, but I, wanted, I wouldn't call myself good either. And I did a lot of things. And in that moment, God met me where I was and washed me clean. Later, uh, some folks came, came, uh, came in, and all I could tell them was, I'm clean. You know, ask, how's it going? I said, I'm clean. I didn't have a lot to say about it. I, just, I was just overwhelmed with the cleansing that had happened. See, the good news of the gospel is that with God, <laughs> forgiveness is overflowing. It's overflowing. It's basic to his nature. It's a mighty fountain. And it just, it, it washes all of us. We're all invited to it to get a drink. Just let it wash over you. And it's one, it's one of the privileges that we get as we strive to know God and as we strive to live in God's will. As hard as that is sometimes, it is so worth it. It is so worth it. But the road there goes directly through the difficult act of confession. I like this. I, I saw this when I saw this slide. God wants to forgive you more than you want to ask for it. You're not waiting on God. He's waiting on you. He's ready. Are we? It's our decision to admit the wrongdoing, to seek restoration, confess that there are things that we ought to have done but we failed to do, and there are things that we're doing that we ought not to do. That's the tough part. But he is faithful. He is faithful because when we come before him, you know, we come with that, the spirit in that old prayer of confession, right? All of us, like sheep, have gone astray. However, 1 John 1, 9 tells us, this is the first verse that I ever memorized. 
If we confess our sin, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If then, if we what? Confess. Then he forgives and cleanses us. Terry Anderson, some of y'all may remember, he was kidnapped by a Muslim extremist in Beirut in 1985 and held for six and a half years. That's him, I think, before and then him when they released him. During that confinement, he ran into a... He didn't run into him. He was confined with Father Jenko, who was a fellow hostage. Anderson had left the church when he was young but had recently resolved to return. Anderson had not gone to confession in many years and decided to take his first formal step back to the church by making confession with Father Jenko. Now, Anderson had spent months lying, chained on a cot with little to do, but read the Bible and examine his broken life. But he poured out his heart to Jenko in a flood of emotions as both men wept. He asked for forgiveness for his sins in word and in thought. For those he had done, things he had done, things he had not done. At the end, Jenko hugged Anderson and declared God's forgiveness. That confession was his first step back to the church. It seemed to him like the right and necessary thing to do. It was fed by a conviction that there is one who is always ready to forgive, always ready to restore us, always ready to welcome us home. He's standing out by the gate looking down the road, saying, come home, come home. The last two weeks, our focus has been on holiness, what it is, what it means in relationship to being a Christ follower. And it, it's difficult to look at those lists, cause, and there's more, and not get a bit overwhelmed by them. It's easy to think either, I give up, I'm never going to get this right, there's no point to it. Or I'm going to redouble my efforts, and I'm, I'm going to make it happen. I'm going to beat my sin down on my own. My hope is that you don't choose either one of those extremes, but to evaluate. Find the areas that need to be given to God and give them to him. He's waiting. Because if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness and there's this too Psalms 103 11 and 12 for as high as the heavens are above the earth so great is his love for those who fear him as far as the east is from the west so far has he removed our transgressions from us how far is the east from the west It's forever. It's a straight line. When we confess to God, he sends them as far as the east is from the west. Why don't we let them go, let let him have them and stop taking them back? Micah 719, he will again have compassion upon us. He will tread our iniquities underfoot. You will cast all our sins into the depths of the sea. This is often paraphrased. As the sea of forgetfulness, God is all about relationship and all about forgiveness. Jeremiah 31, 34. They will not need to teach their neighbors, nor will they need to teach their relatives, saying, You should know the Lord, for everyone from the least to the greatest will know me already, says the Lord. And I will forgive their wickedness, and I will never again remember their sins. Coming out of the joy of resurrection, it's easy to miss or take for granted the cost paid. After all, we are an Easter people. We are a people of the resurrection. But we also must remember that God sent his one and only son, not for his sake, but for ours. Let that settle for a minute. Did he have to send Jesus? No. He sent him for our sake. Abide, that's one of my, I love that word, abide in the thought that God's love for you is unfathomable. Let that 
just overwhelm your heart. Many of you have children or grandchildren or great-grandchildren or all of the above. As a parent or grandparent, would you send them to their death so that others might live? But Mike, God knew Jesus was going to be raised. Yes, he did. You know what else he knew? He knew that he was going to be scourged. He knew that he was going to be whipped. He knew he was going to have to try to carry that cross with all the blood loss. He knew that he was going to be nailed to that cross. He knew that the people who welcomed him into Jerusalem with Hosanna were now called yelling, crucify him. He knew that they were going to take a thorn, a, a crown of thorns, and not just a rosebud thorns, long thorns and jam it on his head. The father knew all of that and sent him anyway. So that we could have a path. He made a path that allows us to live in forgiveness and grace. The last few weeks I've been pushing against the idea of cheap grace because the cost is so high. And I don't ever want us to, to, to forget the cost. But it's grace and it's ours and it's free and you don't have to earn it and it's given to you and it's, late. it's right there. So as we pursue holiness, as we pursue a life of being like Jesus, may we be humble enough to both accept forgiveness and life while recognizing and honoring the price that was paid.